the Canon EOS 650, 620 and 600 SLR film cameras. Why these are great cameras and why you should buy one. Hi, in, in this video I'm going to be talking about um, three very important um, early Canon EOS uh, SLR film cameras. Um, the EOS 650, 620 and 600. And also the, um, the American version of the 600 which was known as the 630. Um, I'll be talking about why they're important um, in Cal Canon's history of SLR cameras. What, what's good about them, what's perhaps not so good about them and uh, why I believe they represent excellent value for money if you still shoot film in 2019. In the mid 1980s Nikon was the undisputed leader in the professional 35mm SLR market um, with their um, F-series cameras. Canon was perhaps number two, but well, well behind Nikon. Anyway, Canon were developing a range of um, autofocus um, cameras, which um, they believed was to be the future. And they made the very bold decision of completely abandoning their FD mount for a new mount called the EF mount, which was not backwards compatible with FD mount lenses. Now, the advantage of Canon doing this meant that they were not hamstrung by having to ensue a backward compatibility with the old manual focus lenses, which gave them more design freedom and allowed them to um, produce a more sophisticated autofocus system. This was something that Nikon could not really seriously contemplate when they moved to autofocus lenses because they had so many uh, professionals um, invested in their system, if they suddenly aban abandoned the Nikon F mount for a new mount, which was incompatible with it, then they, they would have lost their professional market overnight. So it, although it did not make sense for Nikon at that time, it made sense for Canon. Um, it was a gamble that Canon took and a gamble that paid off because with, within a few years, um, Canon would uh, would replace Nikon as the leading uh, manufacturer of professional 35mm SLRs. Um, the beauty of these um, old Canon uh, EOS film cameras is um, being EF mount, they work with the full range of modern EF lenses, which is which is terrific. Um, so that, that's a big advantage. So if, if you're um, an existing Canon DSLR shooter um, and you fancy dabbling in film, fancy shooting some film, um, you can pick up these cameras fairly cheaply and they are fully compatible with your existing lenses. Another good thing about these, um, these cameras is they have beautiful, big, bright, clear viewfinders, um, which are really a joy to use. Um, they also have a really solid build quality, uh, despite being uh, made of moulded plastic. It's very good quality plastic, and that is over the top of um, essentially a, a, a metal inner shell. Um, so they're, they're very reliable. Um, unlike some other um, uh, 80s and 90s film cameras, the, rub the rubber that uh, that covers them, you know, on the, the area of the grip and on the back or wherever, does not go sticky as it ages. These cameras handle really well. They're really nice to shoot with um, and they're not full of um, pointless features that you'll never really use. And they basically have all the essentials and they're very well ergonomically designed and very nice to shoot with.
They are not compatible with uh, Canon's modern TTL flash units. Um, so if you want to use TTL flash with these, you'd be looking at the um, the older Canon flashes from the same era, models such as the um, 540EZ, the 420EZ and the 300EZ. With these models being like the very first EOS or EOS uh, Canon cameras, you, you might think um, maybe the early ones weren't so good and they improved over time. Uh, that's not the case at all. Um, Canon knew when they were developing a brand new mount, a brand new uh, range of cameras, they had to get it right first time. Otherwise it would sink and it could well bankrupt the, com the company. Um, so these were very good cameras right from the start. So you shouldn't worry uh, about buying early models. In fact, I think these are, uh, are nicer than some of the slightly later models. Um, they're certainly better built than some of the, uh, the slightly later ones. Okay, let's um, start where it all began then. The uh, Canon EOS 650. This was the very first Canon uh, EOS um, camera. Um, and the first to use the EF lens mount. By the way, EFS lenses, which are designed for crop sensor digital cameras, will not mount at all on these cameras, as is the case with Canon's full-frame DSLRs. The EOS 650 was launched in March 1987. It was aimed at the, the serious enthusiast um, rather than the pro user, but it's also quite novice friendly as well, having automated features including a program mode for those who like that sort of thing. Um, it is of course an autofocus camera. Um, the lovely bright view viewfinder has um, 0.8 magnification with the 50mm lens. Um, it has a um, built-in um, uh, film wind motor um, which in, when used in continuous shooting allows three frames per second. It has um, automatic um, ISO with the X-coded film, as you might expect. Um, shutter speeds extend from 30 seconds um, all the way down to one two thousandth of a second. And the flash sync is uh, a maximum of one hundred and twenty-fifth of a second. It offers the, uh, all the usual exposure modes you'd find on a modern DSLR. Um, you've got uh, program mode, shutter priority, aperture priority, uh, manual, and also something called depth of field priority um, automatic exposure. Um, it has um, a new type of metering, or a type of metering that was new at the time, called matrix metering which is in most situations uh, much more accurate than um, centre weighted or average meeting, metering. Um, this can be overwritten um, to, uh, to give um, a form of spot metering with a fairly large spot by the press of a button um, when you're taking the shot. Um, in terms of batteries, um, this takes um, two CR5 batteries uh, this takes one of those, um, which were very common in Canon cameras of the period. They're lithium batteries and they're not rechargeable. In terms of weight, um, I would say it's a, it's a mid-weight SLR. Um, it's not as light as some of the uh, 70s um, Canon SLRs. Um, it's a lot lighter than uh, the heavyweight Pro models. 660 grams um, is its weight, including... Uh, sorry, excluding battery lens or film. One strange decision Canon made with this, um, if you wanted to use a remote release, like a cable release, um, the basic camera as supplied is not compatible. You can't connect one to it. You had to buy an optional grip, um, which gave you an additional socket to plug in a remote cable release. That was a very stupid decision by Canon. I don't know why they did that, why they would expect the customers to want to have to pay more for a different grip in order to use a cable release. It seems ridiculous, um, but that's the way they did it. Um, 
as I think I've already mentioned, this, this camera and all the others I'll be talking about in this video work great with modern Canon uh, EF mount lenses. In fact, the lens I use, and it's the, the only Canon lens I currently own, is the EF 40mm f2.8 SDM lens, which is a pancake lens. Um, it's a fantastic lens. It works terrifically on this camera. Um, it's a lens I'd highly recommend. Basically, for less than £200 uh, brand new, you're getting a lens that gives Canon L uh, quality. This isn't one of them, but it's as good as if, and perhaps better than uh, than some of the, the, the L range of lenses. Um, so I'd highly recommend this lens for these cameras um, or indeed any other Canon EF mount cameras. The 620 uh, was launched um, two months after the 650 in May 1987. Um, it's basically um, a slightly upgraded version or deluxe version if you like of the 650 and um, looks almost identical. Um, the main differences uh, between the 620 and the 650 is the, um, the 620 has a top shutter speed of 1 4,000th of a second. Um, it, it also has a raised flash sync speed of 1 250th of a second, which is very welcome. Um, also, the program mode on the 620 is shiftable, so you can, you can shift it. Um, as you can on many modern uh, DSLRs. Um, it also allows double exposures um, and at the press of a button um, it has a backlit, the LCD top display is backlit. Um, it also facilitates um, auto exposure bracketing but it drops the depth of field automatic exposure mode of the 650. Um, and the 620 in includes the optional GR20 grip as standard, which means it's uh, it has a socket to collect, connect a, a remote shuttle release cable. In all other respects, the, um, the 620 is basically the same camera as the 650, just uh, one or two inf uh, improvements. Right, the, uh, the Canon EOS 600, um, which was known as the um, EOS 630 in North America, um, it was in introduced um, a couple of years later in April 1989. Um, this can be considered as essentially um, an EOS 650 Mark II. It's basically an improved version, or an updated version of the 650. Um, now, differences, the difference between the, um, the North American uh, 630 and the rest of the world, uh, the camera that the rest of the world got, i.e. the 600, is that um, the, uh, the 630 was, um, came in a, in, a, in a black finish, just like the original 650 and 620, um, whereas the uh, 600 came in a, what they called a metallic grey finish. I personally think the American version of this camera looks a lot nicer. I think the, the so-called metallic grey looks a little bit cheap to me. Um, but uh, I, that's just a matter of personal preference. Right, so how was the 600 improved then compared to the, uh, the earlier 650? Well, the most important improvement was um, Canon were claiming... Um, autofocus that was two times faster than the, the uh, 650. So they the clearly refined that and made it faster in the, in the two years that have passed since the original camera was introduced. Um, also in continuous shooting mode, it could shoot five frames a second. Now that might not sound particularly fast in 2019, but at the time that was really quick. And if you think about it, if you're shooting film, 36 exposure roll of film, you're shooting at five frames per second, it's not going to take long before you've used your film up. Um, and another thing where, or another way the, the focus was improved on the 600 or 630 was um, Canon claimed it had something called focus prediction, um, which that they claimed automatically anticipates the position of a fast moving subject. It then drives the 
autofocus system during the incident after which the shutter button, button is pressed and before exposure is made. Um, basically, um, it's an improvement in uh, autofocus tracking with fast moving subjects. Um, how much of a difference it made in practice compared to the uh, 650, I'm not sure. I've not really compared them in that respect. Like the 650, it only had a, a top shutter speed of one two thousandths of a, a second and disappointingly also um, only had a flash maximum flash sync speed of 125th of a second. It also has the, the depth of field automatic exposure that the 650 had. Another feature of the um, of the 600 was uh, pick modes, seven pick modes, which are basically scene modes. Um, I'll just put um, a slide up on the screen now um, showing these modes. Um, if you want to, if you're interested in these, want to know more about these, um, I advise you just to pause the video now to give you a chance to read them. Okay, let's um, summarise. I've already said these are really nice cameras to use. They handle really well. Um, well built and pretty reliable. Um, that does not mean that they're not without some problems though. Um, first one is a battery drain problem that um, affects uh, the 620, the 600 and 630. It does not affect the 650. Basically, those models um, have, uh, not the 650, but the others, have um, a backlit LCD, which lights up at the press of a button. Um, there's a capacitor within the circuit for that, which can go bad as the cameras age, um, which causes the, uh, the battery to drain uh, within a few days, even if the camera is switched off. Um, there are some videos to be found online showing uh, how this can be remedied. It basically involves cutting that capacitor out of circuit, which means that the backlight will no longer work, but it also it means that you will not have the battery drain problem. Um, so that, that's one issue. Um, so if you, if you have a camera with that issue, then um, you know, you're either going to need to get it repaired or just live with it. And if you're going to live with it, it's going to mean basically taking the battery out when you finish shooting, which could be a bit of a pain. But as I said, the 650 doesn't have this issue. So that could be one reason for choosing the 650 um, above the other models. Um, another common problem with these, although I've not experienced it with any of my cameras, is um, a sticky shutter issue. Um, this is caused by um, a uh, foam rubber bumper um, that deteriorates over time and basically turns into sticky goo and that can find itself on the um, the shutter curtain blades um, obviously causing problems that is fixable that is repairable um, something you probably won't need to send the camera to a repair shop to fix um, if that does happen with yours it's just a matter of very very gently and carefully um, just cleaning the, the gooey mess off with um, um, some uh, cotton buds or Q-tips moistened in uh, isopropyl alcohol. But you need to do it very, very carefully to avoid damaging your shutter curtain blades. But that, that is an issue, but something that's fixable. As I said, I've never had that problem with any of my cameras, but other people have reported it. Um, now then, uh, I mentioned these cameras are good value. They are extremely good value. Um, for any of these models, you can get, you can pick them up for anywhere between ten pounds and twenty pounds. You can get the very minty one for twenty pounds or less, which is incredible value for money. These are really good cameras. Um, Compare that with some other um, old film cameras on the market today. I mean, some of these plastic point and shoot cameras, um, a lot of which are very basic um, in terms of um, features and uh, a lot of them not very well made. Sometimes they can sell for hundreds of pounds. Um, and that's on cameras where you often do not get any manual control. That just seems ridiculous. And it makes these cameras appear 
um, really good value. Um, I know which I would rather have. Um, I'd much rather have one of these cameras than some plasticky point and shoot. The only reason why I, I can think why anyone would possibly buy a point and shoot over these um, is because they want something small enough to slip into a pocket. Um, or possibly because they need something more stealthy for street shooting. Otherwise, I can't think of any reason to buy a point and shoot over these. Um, if you're not into um, or can't be bothered to learn about the exposure triangle and just want something to point and shoot, when well, you can do it with these anyway because they have a fully automatic program mode anyway. Um, another reason to buy these is they work with any modern Canon uh, EF lenses, obviously not the new mirrorless lenses, but with all the um, DSLR EF mount lenses. Um, what I would uh, a lens I would particularly recommend that's reasonably priced um, is the EF forty millimeter f two point eight pancake lens. Um, it's 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 cheap. It's very compact. It weighs next to nothing, and it is outstandingly sharp. It may only open up to f two point eight, but this is a lens you can use wide open without worrying about softness. Fantastic lens. Another great lens um, that's inexpensive that I'd recommend is Canon's latest um, Nifty 50, uh, the uh, 50mm f1.8 SDM lens. Um, it's not quite as brilliant in terms of image quality as the 40mm Pancake, but it's still a superb lens. Okay, so that, um, that basically wraps it up. Um, I hope you found this um, video useful. If you have, can you please uh, click the like uh, button and, uh, and uh, consider subscribing to my channel. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you again next time.